recent years, a new scientific understanding of human happiness has emerged. Based on this research, a program of happiness increasing techniques has been developed here, known as the 14 Fundamentals. The 14 Fundamentals are the work of Project Director Dr. Michael Fordyce, a world-recognized leader in the field. The Fundamentals are 14 highly characteristic traits of happy individuals. Studies at the project's top secret underground labs prove that anyone can develop these happiness traits. And as they do, they become much happier people. Welcome, my friends, to the next program in your Psychology of Happiness series, WOAP 2. And in this program, we're going to be dealing with two very important fundamentals. The first is, of course, the last of the WOAP 5. Now, don't get confused. The WOAP 5, like yourself, accept yourself, know yourself, help yourself. We discussed those in our last program. Uh, the fifth of those WOAP 5 is so important, it's a fundamental in and of itself. And, of course, that is simply be yourself. The principle that basically suggests how easily, naturally, and usually in your favor things work out when you simply be yourself. In the second part of the program, we'll be dealing with the final fundamental in this personality grouping, and that is simply the idea of eliminating negative feelings and problems, or eliminate the negative. Now, we call this the depressing fundamental, and our discussion may get, well, uh, a little maudlin. But no pain, my friends, no gain. It's an important thing for you to realize how to eliminate negative problems, feelings, and pressures in your life. Now, we'll give you a quick overview of some of the basic mental hygiene techniques that you can employ to keep your own happiness on balance. And it's pretty obvious that one of the things, unfortunately, that gets in many people's way of even beginning to start their climb toward personal happiness are the, you know, emotional downsides of life, the problems, the concerns, the worries, and perhaps even the beginning symptoms of emotional difficulties. So it's a fascinating program we've got lined up for you this evening, Woolock 2, and we'll continue our little journey through the seven-story top-secret underground research complex. So let's begin right now. Dr. Talbot, please call operations. Dr. Talbot, please call operations. Ah, welcome back to your tour of the seven-story top-secret underground research complex that we started in our last episode. This evening, most appropriately, we're beginning our tour right here in our own full production studios. In fact, this is where many of the episodes that you've been watching over the last few weeks have actually originated. Now, this evening, we're dealing with a number of different fundamentals. Of course, fundamental number 11 is Be Yourself. Fundamental number 12, to eliminate negative feelings and problems. But before we do, we need to bring up another fundamental that we've been sort of saving for now. And that's fundamental number 10, developing an outgoing social personality. Yes, long before you can really be yourself, it's pretty clear that many individuals are unable to be so expressive, so outgoing as we'll talk about, because they're basically shy, more inward, more quiet, more introverted. Now, if that falls in your bailiwick, in other words, if you tend to be a little bit more shy than you'd like to, I think our first segment this evening is going to be most interesting to you. In fact, we recorded this earlier for our, you know, new service personnel here in the research laboratory, our younger staff members, to give them a few pointers about how they might develop an outgoing social personality. Fundamental 10 is to develop an outgoing social personality. And this brings us once again to the strong social theme implicit in the 14 Fundamentals program. Ever since our beginning episodes when we went over the big board in the sky, it's been exceptionally clear that social interaction is the number one source of personal happiness, the most potent overall category for personal happiness that we know of. And yet it's also clear that one of the things we know about happy individuals is 
their tremendous extroversion, their tremendously outgoing social personality. Now, we hypothesize that those two naturally go together. One of the reasons that happy individuals are so socially oriented is, of course, because they're so extroverted, and their extroversion, their super social outgoingness helps them in terms of their social lives. So this evening, we're going to examine a little bit more how you might become a lot more social, a lot more outgoing. Now, it's a special lecture. It's only for those of you who basically are somewhat introverted, somewhat shy, and through the course of our discussions, have begun to sort of desire, perhaps, becoming a little bit more social, being able to get out there more comfortably in the social world, because it's fairly clear that without an outgoing, socially comfortable personality, you miss out on that number one most important aspect of personal happiness, and that is an active, busy, and rewarding social life. Now, what we have found basically over the years is a little theory we developed many years ago, known as the fabulous target theory, and here it is, my friends, the target theory. Now, of course, what we're suggesting to you is a very simple proposition. Relationships are much like this target, basically. And that is, if you could imagine for just a moment, at the very center of the target is basically where your heart is. Those are the relationships at the very center that are the closest to you. As you move out in this target range, you find basically that relationships become more and more peripheral and less and less critical to your personal happiness. Now, the theory is a very simple one, one we developed right here in the research labs. That is apparently that the closer relationships come to your heart, in other words, the more important, the warmer, the more intimate those relationships become, obviously the more important and the more critical the impact is to your personal happiness. Now, to demonstrate the target theory this evening, we have one of my assistants, Dr. Vorchek, who will come help us out. This, of course, is the doctor specialty. And, doctor, I'm going to give you your equipment. I certainly hope you'll be as careful as you normally are. You, <laughs> your best judgment. Now, the problem with the target theory is essentially this. Most shy, quiet, introverted people basically long for close love relationships, and eventually we would all like to get to the very center of the target. The problem basically is that many of us make the mistake of trying to hit at the very center of the target first. <laughs> Doctor, very good job. Excellent. Yes, they try to start at the very center of the target first, Obviously, that would be the most desirable. Most shy, quiet people who live relatively lonely lives would obviously like to find love in their life, but unfortunately, by going for the very center of the target, by waiting for love to just randomly come to them, they pretty much miss the boat. Now, in the target theory we have recommended over the years, it is wisest for a person to start at the very edge of the target. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Borchak. Of course, basically, the idea is to start at the very edge of the target, as we've done right here with clubs, organizations, more formal types of socializing. Now, it is these formal types of socializing that seems to be the best way a person could begin working into the target area themselves. Essentially, the nice things about clubs and organizations is they tend to bring you in, tend to make you part of the organizational or the uh, club or the, you know, uh, charity area, things along this line. Then, of course, once one has established themselves, perhaps in this more formal type of organization, what happens next is the development of acquaintances and friendships. <laughs> of course, these usually are derived from the more formal socializing we commit ourselves to. When we join, uh, you know, clubs and organizations, when we take courses at a local college, when we take night courses, for example, when we volunteer for political activities, uh, community help groups, things along this line, that is where we begin to develop the acquaintances, the kind of social contacts that eventually lead to closer, more warm friendships. Whew, mighty nice. These closer, more warm friendships and acquaintances begin to provide our kind of social nucleus. And then, of course, hopefully, if we're lucky, through our friends, family, and our more closer, more intimate associates, we eventually do hit the very center of the target, and if we're lucky, find that one close love relationship that's so important to us. Thank you, Dr. Borchek. Well, my friends, essentially that's kind of the target theory, the idea of moving from the very periphery of social kind of contacts moving inward rather than waiting around in your lonely room, hopefully for the kinds of social 
you know, closer friendships and love relationships that we all seek. Well, talking about becoming a develop, developing an outgoing social personality, it's pretty clear. How does one go about becoming a more socially oriented person? Years ago, a fellow psychologist working right here in the Dr. Fordyce seven-story underground research laboratory came up with one of the major theories that has helped us along. Because it's pretty clear that for a person to become more outgoing, more socially comfortable, it has to happen in gradual little steps. Well, many years ago, a colleague of ours named Dr. Smilemore began to develop what is known as the Smilemore Technique. Now, the Smilemore Technique is a very simple way the average person can begin developing an outgoing social personality. And it is so incredibly easy that even the most shy, even the most introverted, even the most socially frightened person can begin to develop it. Well, the Smile More technique is a very simple proposition of smiling more. Yes, indeed, Dr. Smile More discovered that if he went around the laboratory smiling most everywhere he went, he found that he got incredibly receptive, warm greetings from everyone else here in the old lab. At other times, Dr. Smallmore experimented with, you know, a more negative look on his face. We found him, you know, sitting in the halls, for example, with a kind of a scowl on his face, uh, sort of a negative down look. Or, or sometimes Dr. Smallmore would just simply kind of, you know, be going like this. Well, we didn't really realize that we were being a part of his interesting research. Essentially, what Dr. Smallmore found, and you can experiment with this very same technique, is that when indeed he walked around the lab smiling like this, Obviously, everyone was quite warm, quite receptive. People would actually speak to him. People would actually acknowledge him. Even some of the strangers here in the laboratory, and as we've talked about before, the stranger the better. Even some of the strangers here in the laboratory would actually, you know, say something to him, acknowledge him as he passed by. Well, he was so interested by that reaction and the counter-reaction. He noticed, as you might if you tried this experiment yourself, that when he was sitting there just kind of in a kind of a glum funk, when he'd sit there kind of with a scowl on his face, when he'd walk the halls just kind of, you know, looking at sort of his mean old self, he found that nobody spoke to him. Nobody contacted him. People kind of ran the other way. <laughs> Excuse me, bad arrow. Well, my friends, basically the smile more technique is something you yourself could do. In other words, by smiling a little bit more as you go through your day-to-day -day regime, you may well find that basically people will become a little bit more receptive to you, and it's so easy to do. You don't have to say a single word. Well, that wasn't the end of our research breakthroughs here in the laboratory. One of Dr. Smallmore's brightest students, a young lady, Dr. Sehai, went to a final step. Following very closely in Dr. Smallmore's work, she realized that if a person could actually add one more ingredient to this Smallmore technique, and that was what we refer to as the, well, named after her, the say hi technique. Very simple proposition. She discovered that in addition to walking around the laboratories here with a smile on her face, is she also just said hi just randomly to passers-by. People were even more receptive than the doctor Smilemore's original techniques proved to be. In other words, he was the next step, apparently, in becoming a more outgoing social person, not only smile more, but say hi to anyone and everyone. Amazingly, if you practice this little experiment yourself for a few days on a campus at your place of employment, any place you happen to frequent, you would begin to find many people beginning to converse with you. You, the shy person who could never, you know, make friends, all of a sudden people will be kind of coming into your space and instigating conversations with you. So, that was the miracle of the say hi technique simple enough to do. It's frightening to raise your hand or to nod your head and say, hi, or how are you, or what's happening, you know, something along that line. Eventually, of course, Dr. Smilemore and Dr. Say Hi, his lovely assistant, became so involved with each other's techniques of one of the happier stories in the research labs that they eventually ended up marrying each other and have lived relatively happily ever after. In fact, <clears throat> I was recently at their home where we were able to, you know, meet with them once again, and, and they're a darling couple. Uh, it, it's the most amazing sort of thing to see. Uh, Dr. Smallmore, of course, stays on his side of the room, and he just kind of smiles, you know, constantly, admiringly at uh, Dr. Sehai, and she, in turn, uh, sits in her chair and smiles, and occasionally kind of waves at Dr. Smallmore. So it's a little sickening, but I think you get to the point. If you're ready for your next step then, basically, in terms of developing a closer or developing a more outgoing social personality, 
The next step is meeting people. Now, we've talked about joining clubs and organizations as a great way because they sort of draw you in, but the next step requires a little bit more boldness yourself. What I mean by that is basically what we recommend for shy or more introverted people to get their social feet wet is to practice meeting new strangers. Now, it's a tough assignment, but on a college campus, very much like many of you all are on, or in various other social settings, there are always opportunities to perhaps go up to somebody brand new, someone you don't know well, someone you've just seen perhaps around the office area, and simply strike up a conversation with them. Now, be well aware that in the beginning stages, this is going to be a very awkward experience for you. You're not going to feel comfortable at all in terms of meeting new people, but the value is you don't have to be successful. You see, with like any behavioral change that a person wishes to make, the key, unfortunately, is practice, practice, practice. You'll never become comfortably socially. You'll never become comfortable meeting new people until you've been through the experience many, many times. So anticipate that the first few times you're just going to bungle you know, you're going to blow the whole thing. You may not even think of things to say. You may have those awkward experiences where a conversation flops. And if you expect that, it may not be so bad. But as time goes by, you will find, essentially, that as you begin to meet one new person a day, your comfort level in those situations will tend to grow. One of the basic underlying principles that psychologists have developed over the years, and we like to refer to it as the Acts First Principle, it's something that's handy for virtually any personality change that you ever would wish to undertake. Now, the act first principle is a very simple idea that for any deep fundamental personality change, for the most part, you have to act the way you want to be first, and then hopefully, eventually your feelings catch up. Like being an outgoing, friendly, socially oriented person. Most people mistake the sequence of personality change. Somehow they hope that their feelings will change first, and then, of course, their behavior will naturally flow. You know, you want to become a generous person, for example. You're not now. Well, I guess you could sit in your room thinking, I've got to start feeling generous. I've got to start, you know, wanting to give till it hurts. But the act first principle suggests that really to become a generous person, you have to start acting like a generous person first, and then the feelings start catching up. So what do you do? Well, you answer the doorbell every time, you write out a check for every charity, you dump the money in the little charity boxes at the 7-Eleven or the little Salvation Army ladies or during Christmas time, things like that. Now at first you hate yourself, you're not feeling generous at all, but you're going through the motions. And the more and more you act generously, eventually the more and more you begin to feel sort of generous. Your old friends say, my goodness, you're becoming a kind of a generous dude or chick, aren't you? Uh, you become sort of a feeling that, hey, you know, maybe I am really generous. And as time goes by, your feelings catch up to match the actual behavior you're emitting. Well, it's the same with any fundamental personality change. The behavior has to come first. The feelings follow. So to become a more outgoing, to develop an outgoing social personality, you're going to have to act like an outgoing social person would. And what do they do? Well, they smile more, they greet passers-by, they strike up conversations with strangers or people they don't know well, they go to social situations, they join clubs, organizations, groups, uh, community actions, so on and so forth. They take up social invitations when invited. In other words, they put themselves where the people are. Well, interestingly enough, that is the way to begin feeling like an outgoing social personality as you yourself begin to develop or as you begin to expose yourself bit by bit to social situations. At first, awkward, uncomfortable, a nervous wreck, not knowing what to say. You're feeling still like that shy, insecure person you always were, but at least you're behaving like the outgoing, friendly person you'd like to be. Eventually, what you find is your feelings will begin catching up. And one day, you'll wake up and actually feel comfortable in the many social settings that you have been exposing yourselves to. Well, my friends, that's the secret to developing an outgoing social personality.
Here we are on my favorite level of the complex, the guest level. On this level, we have the auditorium we use for international conferences and happiness research seminars where we gather dignitaries and famous scientists from throughout the world. In fact, it was right here in this auditorium last year when I was honored with the Nobel Prize for Happiness Research. But unfortunately, like most things here in the lab, that too must remain secret. But it's here at our smaller auditorium where we have our regular staff meetings. And today, we've got something rather special to talk about, so let's go. Attention delegates, the European conference is about to resume. Attention delegates, the European conference is about to resume. Well, today's a very special day here in the underground laboratories, and I want to welcome the staff as well as many of our international dignitaries who are with us. We've been working, as you well know, for many years to come up with a way to explain the fifth of the wall out five, be yourself, so important it's also a separate fundamental, a way to explain it in terms that the average person can understand. Well, I think our staff has finally come up with the answer in a scheme or an idea that we refer to as the A's and the B's. Of course, to understand the A's and B's analogy we've created, one has to imagine that, like these little blocks, there are different types of people in the world. There are all kinds, and all kinds of different varieties. There are A types, there are B types, there are C types of persons, and so on and so forth. There even what? I think we've got an X in here somewhere. There are all kinds of different types of people. Now that just simply proves the basic idea that people are different. There's no doubt about that. No two people are exactly alike. And that's one of the basic propositions that one has to accept before they can understand the A's and the B's. Now the first of those propositions is the fact that people are indeed different. Everyone knows that. I don't think that comes as a great shock to anyone. But the problem with that is, is that because people are different, Proposition 2 suggests that not everyone's going to get along. The A's may not get along with the, well, the X's or the uh, H's or whatever. Some people are so different, so dissimilar, that they're not really going to get along that well. Well, that leads us to the third proposition, that not everyone is going to like you. If you're special, if you're individual, if you develop any kind of, you know, uh, personality at all, not everyone is going to actually like you, nor are you, if you're honest, going to really deeply like and admire, or at least get along with, you know, other individuals that are quite different from you. So we're three steps closer to understanding the A's and the B's. Now, apparently, if one, people are different. If two, basically, not everyone is going to... Uh, you know, get along because of these differences, and three, that apparently not everyone's going to like you, then apparently I would suggest your job is a very simple one. What you want to find, obviously, are those individuals who like you just the way you naturally are, and thus our little analogy. Let's assume for a minute that you're basically an A-type person. And there are all kinds of other people out there, as we suggested, there are the B-types, there are the C types, there are the D types, and of course, as we see here, many, many other types. But the beauty of it is, is that somewhere out there, there are other A type people, other types of people that apparently are quite similar to you. In other words, these are the people that you would probably get along best with. These are people that share your interests, share your you know, fun times, uh, the type of people that basically share your general beliefs about life, that uh, share your values, that live their lifestyle pretty much in the same fashion, and basically would find you quite a compatible person to be with. Well, the secret is, out there in that real world, <clears throat> obviously, there's all kinds of people, and how are you, let's assume that you're this A, how are you going to find those people who are right for you. Well, it's a very simple proposition. Be yourself. Extrovert the personality you have. Be an obvious A. 
And the reason what, of course, will happen is various things. Now, let's assume for a minute here is a person who's being an obvious A. Let's see what happens. Now, the B looks at you, basically, and thinks, my goodness, there's an obvious A, and A is just simply being their old A self, and even though I have a few A acquaintances, most of my friends are B types, and so basically I think I'll head on down to the B place where the B people are and spend my time with them, and of course they run the other way. The C type looks at you and says, well, interestingly, there's another A type person. You know, I have a few A types, but ordinarily there's a lot of conflict with them. I've got my C friends and lovers, so I'm going to head on down to the old ABC or ABC is lounge, I guess, basically, and meet up with my friends. The D looks at you and essentially says, hmm, yeah, well, once again, here's an obvious A being himself, and I usually don't get along with A, so they head the other way, but lo and behold, what happens when Mr. A trips along and happens to notice you? Thinking to himself, here is an obvious A, my type of person. Well, obviously, if their perception is correct, and if you're really being yourself, they recognize right off the bat that they're going to get along famously with you. They run in to develop a relationship with you, and the two of you live happily and harmoniously ever since, or ever, uh, evermore, or whatever. <laughs> the point is clear. When you be yourself, you tend to attract the people that are right for you, and at the same time, detract those individuals that the potential is pretty poor that you'll get along with. This leads us to one of the other major propositions behind the A's and the B's. And that is that often it's just as important to be detractive as it is to be attractive. We all want to be attractive, certainly. We all want to be desired by others. But do we want to be universally desired or do we rather want to be desired by those people we're going to get along with best? Is it really worth our while to be really attractive to all kinds of different, incompatible type people? Well, the doctor thinks not. He thinks it's just as important to be somewhat detractive, to let people know even from the beginning that the relationship might not be right. Well, all this would be quite simple if that's the way it normally works. But unfortunately, many other scenarios seem to take place because most people have such a difficult time being themselves. Let's take this particular example. The example of the shy person. The example of the person who really doesn't give off much information. Now, what does this person look like to the real world? Well, this person looks like a blank. Other people really don't quite know how to read this particular person. Shy, quiet, introverted people give off very little information. And because of that, basically, other individuals have a difficult time reading them. And everyone seems to read them in their own special and apparently incorrect way. Let's look at the analogy again with the shy, introverted person. Now, here's Mr. D stumbling along, and he looks at this basic blank and says to himself, Well, <laughs> nice figure, nice shape, but I'm really not getting much of a reading. I have no real idea what might happen to be in here. So Mr. D decides basically to kind of go the other way. He's not picking up all that much. Mr. A, and that's the unfortunate part, he looks at this blank too, getting no particular reading, although we know that deep down inside there's an A, but Mr. Blank, I mean, Mr. A doesn't know that. All he sees is basically, you know, a very nondescript, very little information coming forth. And so therefore, he may well, the person that would actually be right for this person, may choose to go the other way himself, leaving this poor A person all alone. But let's take another possibility, Mr. C. Mr. C looks at this package and thinks, my goodness, what a package, what a shape. That's my kind of chick. And Mr. C runs in to develop a relationship all the time, assuming, of course, that this A is another C like himself. But, unfortunately, we know the truth of the matter. This is not a C at all. Actually, this is our old A self. So what eventually happens? Well, because of the shy, non-forthcoming person, is basically so quiet and reveals so little, and it takes so long often to get to know them, that this Mr. C may be quite happy with this question mark for quite a while. But unfortunately and invariably, there will come a time where this A person begins to, either on purpose being tired of not expressing themselves, or because Mr. C more and more discovers one day they wake up 
Mr. C. realizes he has been with an A. Oh, my goodness. Why didn't you tell me you were an A, says Mr. C. He's hurt. He's disappointed. He feels like he was sold a false bill of goods. And you are trapped in a relationship where it's so mismanaged. It can't possibly work. Mr. C. runs the other way, leaving you alone and hurt, primarily because you weren't able to really be yourself. Well, that's the example of the shy person, but there are other interesting examples. <laughs> Some individuals, for various reasons, even though they're basically A types, decide that they would much rather be other types. Or they look around, say, the campus and realize that actually it's the D's, you know, or the basic C's, that are essentially the N types. And so, therefore, they go to a great deal of effort, instead of being an A, they go a great deal of effort to make themselves look like a C. They head on down to the big C stores, they buy a bunch of C clothes, they start doing the C walk, talking the C talk, hanging out at the C places. And then, of course, what happens is the very worst possible scenario. First of all, they become incredibly attractive to other C's. You know, Mr. D looks at them and thinks to themselves, or Mr. D, for example, looks at them and thinks to himself, ah, it's an obvious C, I can get along with C, they're such prima donnas, and heads the other way. Mr. E looks at you and thinks, oh my goodness, there's another C, I don't get along with them, and he heads the other way. But Mr. B looks at you, or I'm sorry, I'm getting so confused here, Mr. C looks at you and says, ah, there's a new C in town, and immediately rushes in to develop a warm relationship with you, which works out fine as long as this C can maintain the pretense. But eventually, after a while, this C is going to get a little tired of being a C. This C, whether they even are trying desperately, sometimes those A qualities will begin to kind of pop out. And all of a sudden, one day, Mr. C wakes up in horrification, realizing that you were an A all along. Where is this C I married? I want my C back. Well, it's too late then. He's found you out that basically you were an A putting on a C disguise. Leaves you once again, lonely, blue, and sad. Well, now there are many reasons why we put on different faces. Perhaps we wanted to be the C person our parents always wanted us to be. Perhaps we wanted to be the U person that seemed to be so popular. Perhaps we wanted to be the I person that, you know, uh, our grandparents decided we were going to be or that appeared to be socially acceptable or perhaps our spouse or family members stressed so hard but unfortunately we're kind of stuck being ourselves and when we purposely put on a false image we become attractive to the wrong people and unfortunately detractive to the very people who would be best at us because while we're playing our charade Mr. A, the person who would really be perfect for us, looks and says, Oh my God, there's one of those disco seeds. I just can't abide by them. And heads the other way. The worst of all scenarios. Here's a person who's basically being attractive to the wrong people and detractive to the person who might be best for them. Well, my friends, essentially, that's kind of the idea behind the A's and the B's analogy. And the point is pretty clear. By just simply being yourself being what you naturally are. Everything seems to work out so harmoniously, so comfortably, and usually in your best interest. If you simply just portray yourself the way you are, be honest from the very start, as we've talked about before, and essentially, you know, just be yourself and let the chips fall where they may. Because when you are, apparently you will tend to avoid a great deal of interaction with those people that simply recognize from the start that they're incompatible with you, and you tend to be attractive to the people who would be right for you. Of course, we're practically through our tour now. We're almost to the bottom floor. We're at floor six, and this is where we study be yourself and eliminate the negative. Eliminate the negative. 
or eliminate negative feelings and problems, basically, is what that's long or short for. But we suggested when we got to that, be kind of the depressing fundamental, because we'd have an opportunity to talk about some of the things that, you know, hurt individuals in their pursuit of happiness, rather than the things that they can do to actually enhance it. And it seems that one of the things that gets in the way of most individuals' happiness, or many individuals' happiness, is the chronic suppression of negative emotional experience. Now, we talked about that last week when we uh, dealt with the past negative personality, the individual that has, you know, gone through a lot of negative, unhappy experiences in life, and tends to have not fully resolved those. Well, one of the other major items that gets in the way of most people's both mental and physical health is the chronic suppression of emotion. What we're suggesting here this evening is that the chronic bottling of emotion will get you one way or the other. If it does not get you emotionally and create emotional difficulties and the beginning, perhaps, of some full-blown emotional difficulties, it will also get you physically. And it does seem to do it one way or the other. You see, the analogy seems to be very much like this. We can see your brain, I guess, <clears throat> as being very much, you know, like a pressure cooker to some extent, with the lid clamped down to varying degrees of tightness. Now, many of us obviously have what we could call a relatively loose lid, I would suggest. And that's an individual who apparently has opened the old pressure valve. We'll put that over here. You know, I don't know where those pressure valves are on those damn things, but nonetheless, this is the way it looks here. Apparently, they have their pressure valve fairly wide open. In other words, as the emotional uh, difficulties, as the emotional experiences of life, you know, as they go through these things, Apparently, most all of the negative emotionality that goes into the cooker has a way of naturally escaping and ventilating almost directly and sometimes almost immediately with healthy individuals, happy individuals who tend to be able, tend to be marvelously able to express their emotions when they feel them, both their positive emotions and their negative emotions. Now, we're talking obviously here about it's the suppression of negative emotionality but obviously the suppression of positive emotionality gets in the way of many individuals' happiness. Here we're talking about the individual who finds it very difficult to express love and affection, the type of individual who is very non-demonstrative in terms of their positive feelings toward others, but it is more the suppression of negative emotionality that eventually deteriorates both your psychological health as well as your physical health. Now, what we're suggesting is for the individual that chronically bottles this emotion up, it is very much like the pressure valve being tightly clamped down, the lid being tightly clamped on, the heat to some extent building and going down as one goes through life with the various ups and downs of life. But what happens unfortunately for the individual who tends to suppress and bottle their emotions is that as they go through life, layer upon subtle layer, of negative emotionality builds up in their mind, builds up in their memory banks, often not necessarily consciously, but it is there. And as these experiences build these deposits of negative emotionality, the pressure begins to slowly increase. Now, as the pressure increases, a number of rather unfortunate things occurs to an individual, mostly physically, but also psychologically. As this pressure builds psychologically, now, even on an unconscious level, it tends to have some rather negative side effects on one's physical health. Your body tends to react to the kinds of stress, the kind of pressure that this buildup of negative emotions tends to develop. And as the pressure increases, the toll on your body's systems becomes stronger and stronger. Now, the sad part of this, apparently, is that if this goes on for long periods of time, your body that is working so hard to deal with this kind of negative emotional stress tends to fall down in its ability to ward off various diseases and to keep your body essentially healthy and strong. Now, that is why the chronic buildup of negative emotionality will eventually get you physically. And it is one of the reasons men in our society die almost, what is it, 10, 15 years, I believe, younger than the average woman does, primarily because men tend to be much more guilty of this kind of emotional suppression, emotional dial, keeping a tight lid on their emotional side. Women, on the other hand, tend to be very good at expressing their emotions. In fact, uh, even though often criticized for it, you know, and now in these days of equal rights, 
We find that psychologically speaking, this is one of the healthy qualities that women possess that men can definitely learn and profit from. Apparently their ability to express negative emotions is the one thing that apparently explains a rather interesting irony. Women typically tend to live more stressful and more emotionally trying lives than the average man does. And yet at the same time they end up living longer and often somewhat healthier because of their marvelous ability to express emotions. I believe this is one of the reasons why, after all the statistics have been said and done with, that women apparently, and men, even though they live such different lives, end up essentially equal in the happiness ratings. That's been one of the more remarkable findings over the years, that there seems to be no sex differences when it comes to personal happiness. And apparently this may be one of the reasons that women with their increased stresses and perhaps their less rewarding roles in life can end up in the long run being just as happy because they are so able to work through effectively the emotional difficulties they experience. But men, unfortunately, by bottling these emotions, tend to leave themselves wide open for a variety of health problems, emotional difficulties, so on and so forth. Now, that is why, my friends, that the number one correlate of good mental health will surprise you. But I think after our little talk this evening, I think you're beginning to get a clue. The number one correlate of good physical health, more than anything else, tends to be mental health. Over the many years, it seems that the individuals that enjoy the best physical health are also the individuals that have developed the highest degree of mental health. Now, that may sound like a little bit of a surprise because, in a way, mental health levels tend to be better predictors of physical health than a whole variety of other health habits, exercise habits, things along this line. Now, the reason that seems to be, however, is that healthy individuals have developed the ability to release this kind of tension, pressure, and emotionality when it occurs, usually quite effectively, quite directly, generally to the people that have created those situations and try to work them out through negotiation, confrontation, speaking up for themselves, self-assertion, so on and so forth. We've been talking about the physical problems that relate from the chronic suppression of emotion, but that's only part of the story. If it doesn't get you physically, it will get you psychologically. Because eventually, the same kind of chronic buildup of negative emotional stress begins to put tremendous pressures on one's psychology. Stress, pressure, the chronic buildup of this negative emotionality has a tendency after many years to begin to distort one's thinking, to begin to exaggerate one's perceptions and thoughts, to begin to strain one's social contact and social relationships, and it is the chronic buildup of such negative emotionality that is probably the underlying cause for many individuals of emotional difficulties later on in life. Now, how these things begin to occur, you know, are very, very subtle. But I think you can see that the buildup of emotionality like this is one of the things that will get you one way or the other, either physically or psychologically. And so essentially what we're suggesting is that the better you can become at releasing emotional feelings when you feel them. Uh, and it's not directly when you feel them, soon thereafter. By either being able to express them in the privacy of your own room, someplace out in nature perhaps, uh, you know, beating on a pillow if you feel angry, giving in to crying if you feel sad. So many individuals, especially men, have a difficult time crying. And yet it is nature's way of cleansing this emotional system to keep the buildup of emotion kind of down to a bare minimum. The final way, of course, is by being able to express these things and talk them over, you know, with someone you trust, someone you're basically close to. And obviously my wish is for all of you that you have already found in your life or will find, you know, friends that you can really trust, perhaps uh, a family member, perhaps uh, a minister, some close friend along that line, uh, perhaps your spouse can be this one close person in your life that you can feel comfortable enough to get these things literally off your chest and off your mind. Uh, the old analogy is very true. Fortunately, uh, for those of you who are not able to find those things in your own life, obviously in this century especially, psychology has recognized the value of this kind of emotional ventilation and we have developed a variety of counseling, uh, public agencies, uh, religious groups, things like this where people can find the kinds of good close friends that perhaps many are just unfortunate enough to have in real life. Well, we finally made it. 
to the very bottom of the research complex, the very basement floor, where we finish up our tour. Now, unfortunately, we can't show you much of this top-secret floor. We're still not really authorized to do so. But I suspect maybe we could possibly take a peek and find out what's happening. <laughs> uh, that indicates the research is continuing very well, even on this floor. Well, let's continue with tonight's program, however. So some final thoughts on mental health and happiness. Happiness is nature's way of rewarding us for healthy development in life. Happiness is kind of nature's primary symptom of good mental health. Now, that's the way I would like you all to think about it this series, or as you continue on, that happiness, in a sense, is the primary symptom, really, of mental health. That, I think, is the easiest way to understand it, and I think that can become a little clearer as we examine the opposite end of the spectrum. In other words, the world of those individuals who are not that emotionally healthy, the individuals who are emotionally disabled, the individuals who we traditionally used to refer to as the mentally ill. Now, that term mental illness is kind of archaic in lots of ways. It used to convey, I think, to the average public that, you know, most individuals, schizophrenic, psychotic, so on and so forth, basically were suffering from some biochemical disease. Now, there is some basis for that in a small percentage of the cases. That still remains true. But... The term illness has sort of fallen by the wayside because it didn't have that strong physiological causality. Nonetheless, the term still has a lot of meaning in kind of an intuitive sense, in the fact that most illness is extremely painful, and emotional illness is perhaps the most painful of all. What I mean by this is basically the idea that individuals who are suffering from severe emotional disorders basically are coping with incredible levels of negative emotion. Now, we all see, and we see, you know, publicized in, oh, movies, magazines, things along this line. We see the bizarre picture of the emotionally disturbed. We see their crazy behavior. We see them, you know, mutilating themselves, beating their heads on the wall, shrieking for hours on end, or just sitting in a corner for days and weeks at a time, weeping perhaps uncontrollably, so on and so forth, talking in gibberish, doing all kinds of sort of strange invisible things with invisible friends or whatever, hearing things, talking to themselves. And I think most of us get the view of emotional illness, therefore, is, 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 is just a lot of disturbed behavior. And as far as it goes, uh, that goes, it's correct. There is a lot of disturbed behavior, obviously, as part of the diagnosis of these conditions, but if that was all that was really wrong, perhaps it wouldn't be that bad a way to go. Perhaps more of us might kind of choose to act a little more crazy to get out of our jobs and other responsibilities and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, that's rarely the case. What really causes that disturbed breakdown in personality is that these individuals have dealt with and continue to deal with incredibly strong and, you know, often violent levels of negative emotion. You know, extremely black and leaden depressions, uh, tremendous feelings of sinfulness and guilt, tremendous fears, phobias, and irrational, you know, uh, uh, frights, uh, tremendous hatreds and angers and resentments and bitterness, often mostly turned inward on themselves. And so, therefore, the primary cause of most emotional difficulties is severe you know, negative emotion, intolerable levels of negative emotion. And so therefore, we can kind of suggest that the primary symptom, therefore, of emotional disturbance would be negative emotion. The primary cause of most emotional difficulties is large, uncontrollable amounts of negative emotion. Negative emotion that we all feel, by the way, none of us are true strangers to mental illness. We should not see it as a strange, bizarre condition that affects only a very few. I would dare say most all of us have come very close in our lives to visiting that particular point. I think if you think about some of the more, you know, devastated periods of your life, and I think most of us have had periods of our lives where things were so pessimistic, so dark, so blue, so unhappy, I think if you can recall that period, and I don't want you to dwell on it, but just for a minute you can, you can begin to get a kind of a feel of what the emotionally, you know, disturbed have to deal with on a permanent kind of a basis. How did you feel then? How was your thinking? You probably felt emotionally about as bad as you possibly could. Your thoughts 
just didn't seem to really come together. You seemed rather confused. Uh, nothing really quite went together. And what thoughts you thought were so negative, so pessimistic. Everyone hates you. No one loves you. You wanted to withdraw. You didn't want to talk or deal with anybody. You know, you hoped the whole thing would go away. And your feelings became increasingly more exaggerating as time went on. Well, if you can imagine what that would be like, just carried on and on and on. You probably have a much better idea of what emotional difficulties are like, so we're not strangers to these. The real difference between us, I guess, is the amount that you have had to go through was not perhaps as severe and didn't start perhaps as young as it might in the severely emotionally disturbed. Or perhaps your coping abilities have been much better. But, nonetheless, we're getting way out of the way. Our topic is <laughs> happiness. Right, my friends? Yes. The point is clear, however. The mental health happiness connection basically goes together very well. If negative emotionality is the basic cause and the basic symptom, in a sense, of emotional disturbance, emotional breakdown, you know, uh, those mental illnesses, then indeed the reverse is also true. That happiness, in a sense, joy, a feeling of fulfillment, is what mental health is all about. Well, there you have it, my friends, our program on WOAP 2, dealing with two of the more important fundamentals, of course, be yourself, how easily, naturally, and in your best interest things happen when you just simply uh, be yourself and let the chips fall where they may. Nine times out of ten, remember, they'll fall right in your lap if, of course, that's where they, you want them to. And, of course, our depressing fundamental, eliminate negative feelings and problems, and I'm sort of glad to be over with that. Uh, you know, we have to get a little depressing at times, but it's pretty obvious that it's important for your happiness, and the rest of these programs are still upbeat. I'm sure you haven't minded. Well, in our next program that follows, we're going to be dealing with love relationships. That's right. Yes. Oh, fantastic. I've been looking for these. Thank you. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, this is extremely interesting. Well, some fresh research from the laboratories, my friends. And it just goes on and on like this, day after day, new information that eventually uh, will go into our research programs and, of course, eventually to make you a much happier person. Well, next time we get together, as I say, we're going to be dealing with love relationships in the program entitled Love is Number One. Close love relationships and a tremendously potent effect on your personal happiness. So we'll see you then. Meanwhile, I'm going to digest these reports. This looks great. Dr. Ingersoll to Lab 91. Dr. Ingersoll to Lab 91. Attention, a level three systems check is in progress. Attention, a level three systems check is in progress. Well, we're back here in the Fortnite Research Laboratories to find out what people right here think of the fabulous 14 fundamentals. Oh, sure, excuse me. Uh, we're asking some of the staff members what they think of the fabulous 14 fundamentals. The 14 fundamentals are great. They've really changed my life since I learned about them from you, sir. Well, thank you so much. Oh, Doctor? Yes. Can you tell us what you think of the fabulous 14 fundamentals? I think they're the best scientific findings of the deck game. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Well, Doctor, what do you think of the fabulous 14 fundamentals? Oh, I believe they are the best thing to achieve happiness there ever was. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, we're talking to another one of our colleagues here in the lab. And, Doctor, what do you think uh, of the Fabulous 14 Fundamentals? Well, I feel like they are practical steps that any person can apply their life to increase their happiness and to really fulfill a healthy personality. Well, thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Well, and tell me, what do you think of the Fabulous 14 Fundamentals? Doctor, there is no better tool to get yourself totally squared away. Well, that's what I think, too. Thank you so much. And what do you think of the Fabulous 14 Fundamentals? Just fantastic. Well, thank you, Doctor. I think it's great. It's totally changed my life. Well, that's good to hear. All right. And what do you think of the Fabulous 14 Fundamentals? I think they're the greatest research breakthrough of our time. Well, thank you, Professor. You're I welcome. appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, and tell us, what do you think of the Fabulous 14 Fundamentals, Doctor? Well, I think the person who wrote The Psychology of Happiness is just the most brilliant person there ever was. <laughs> well, of course, you know that's me, don't you, Doctor? Yeah, I do. 
Well, there you have it, my friends. That's what people right here at the Underground Laboratories think of the 14 fundamentals. Dr. Harold, please contact 312. Dr. Harold, please contact...